Good morning. Please stand and join in our opening hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Seated. Greetings in the name and grace and peace of Jesus, our resurrected Christ. Good morning, friends, and welcome to St. Paul's. My name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you into worship this morning. Uh, as we get started today, I have a few announcements for you. First of all, there is a blood drive happening downstairs, so I think you can sneak in right after service if you would like to donate blood uh, to still get in and to do that, and we're grateful that we've had so many folks participating this morning. Also wanted to remind you that today is the last opportunity that you have to donate for the Cross Lines Christmas fundraiser. Uh, we've long partnered with Cross Lines as they have partnered with folks in our community to help meet needs. And so uh, this year we are collecting money as, uh, to, to support their Christmas store. And so uh, if you want to donate to that, you can write a check and just put Cross Lines Christmas in the memo. We'll make sure it gets to the right place. You can give online in the drop down menu. There's a way to select that. But know this, this is a way that we get to partner with Cross Lines and bless our community. Uh, but do that today. Uh, they're uh, they're going to be setting up their stores soon, so they need to, to have all of that accounted for. A couple of things to note this week. Number one, Love Team is meeting Tuesday evening at 6.30. Uh, all are welcome to come and to participate and to be a part of the conversation about how it is that we reach out and celebrate and connect with one another. So that's this Tuesday. And then um, the Dialogue Institute is hosting a Friendsgiving on Friday at 9.30 a.m. Well, we'll meet here at 9.30 a.m. This is uh, specifically for women in the church, because the Dialogue Institute um, has hosted us. They are uh, Turkish Muslim friends of ours, and so this is a good opportunity for conversation, but meet here at 9.30. And then next week, um, we will be, uh, after the 11 o'clock service, we will be hanging the greens. 
Um, it's our chance to decorate for, for Advent and for Christmas. It's one of my favorite things to do. So we'll have lunch following worship next week. Um, and I hope that you will stick around for that. We'll have opportunities for you to get your photos taken throughout Advent um, and to, to help celebrate and do all of those things. So I hope that you'll plan to be here next week and to stick around afterwards uh, for worship. Uh, another note um, that, that I, I need to remember is that we are wrapping up our financial stewardship campaign. And so uh, there are many of you who have turned in a pledge card like this. Uh, we've received about two-thirds of the number of cards, not finances-wise, but but that we are hoping to. So that means there's still some out there. If you haven't had an opportunity to do that yet, I would encourage you to do that either online or there's paper copies out there. But I just want you to keep that, I want to keep that on your radar because our finance team will be meeting uh, in a few weeks to, to begin planning uh, for the mission and the ministry that God has for us in the year to come. And, and we uh, use sort of those commitments to help us plan our ministry together. Uh, friends, this morning is a great morning in worship. We're finding ourselves in the midst of a season in which we talk uh, about gratitude and remind ourselves what it means to be centered on that. Uh, this week, we get to hear from Pastor Andrea Roth, who is a provisional elder um, who works in chaplaincy and calls this her church home. Next week, we'll get to hear from Pastor Eric. Uh, but as we continue through this month in which we're invited to take stock of all that we have to be grateful for, I'm excited for the message that we have this week and next week. As you are able, I would invite you to stand to join together in our call to worship. People of God, listen to God's teaching. Turn your attention towards the word of the Lord Everyday stories that contain wisdom of the ages. As we near the time of the year when extended families gather around the table, we can teach our children the story of their ancient family of origin. With all this truth, they learn to hope in God Remember God's good works and keep God's commandments. Amen. Please join in our hymn, Now Thank We All Our God.
let's join together to affirm our faith. We, we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. Uh, this morning we are changing things up a little bit to a, a new order of worship, so up to this point has all felt very comfortable. Um, as the ushers prepare to take our offering, I wanted to just highlight a little bit of the good ministry that's happening in this church. So uh, we don't have them at this service, but at the first service today, we got to celebrate two of our acolytes uh, who are graduating out of the program. Who knew that you could graduate at seventh grade? Um, <laughs> But as you know, each week we have one of our elementary age students who brings in the light of Christ. Uh, this for us is a reminder of who it is that we're called to be, that when we gather to worship, our attention and our energies are focused on God who is among us. At the end of each service, we will have an acolyte come and take the light out to remind us that each one of us uh, has within us the gift of God and the light of Christ that we go to share with the world. And, and friends, what I love about that is not only the symbolism of what acolytes mean, I also love that we have children leading us in worship. And one of the things that I have most loved about this community and the few months that I've been here is the ways that we allow our children and our youth to shape and to teach and to lead us in so many different avenues. So uh, I'm celebrating that this week. I wanted you to know that we had two young ladies that we were celebrating. Uh, there's so much good stuff happening in this community. As we continue in worship, we move into a time of offering where we get to respond uh, with our gifts and tithes in response to all that God has blessed us with. Uh, so I'll invite our ushers forward to receive that now.
holy God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for the gifts that you have poured out into our lives. And Lord, we ask that this offering be blessed to multiply the work that you are doing in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd like to invite our ushers to bring the attendance pads forward. It is such a joy to worship with you today. Please register your attendance in our attendance pads. And I'd like to invite the choir to come forward and our kids through sixth grade uh, to join me and Miss Sherry for Kids Connection and our helper helpers. Uh, Miss Shannon is here today and we are going to have a lesson. Kids through sixth grade, you guys can come on up. Um, kids through sixth grade are invited to join us.
Good morning. As Kyle said, my name is Andrea Roth, and I am a provisional elder in the United Methodist Church. My full-time appointment is as a chaplain at the University of Kansas Hospital, but this is my church home, and you all are the congregation and people that have supported me through my call and through the process of ordination, and so for that, I thank you, and I thank Kyle and Eric for inviting me to share uh, the word with you all this morning in this holy place. We'll start with some scripture from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, siblings, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was 19 years old, I went to a birthday party for a newly minted two-year-old. Her presents were piled up and she was surrounded by family, her parents, both of her grandmothers, aunts, uncles, cousins. This was a little girl who was an only child of parents in their 40s and she had lots of love, lots of attention, and lots and lots of gifts. So she would grab one and open it up exclaim excitedly, push it aside, and reach for the next one. And at some point, I said, hey, Katie, say thank you to your grandma before you open the next present. Thanks, grandma. Present. I didn't think anything of it, and it probably wouldn't even be in my memory bank to share with you today, except two to three weeks later, I got a message through the familial grapevine that her parents did not appreciate me disciplining their daughter on her birthday. Okay. Um... I thought I was supporting a family just norm, right? That, that you say thank you when somebody gives you something. But they had a different de definition of whose job it was to teach those family norms. And so I had inappropriately disciplined their toddler. So this kind of begs the question, when do we learn and how do we learn to express thanks, appreciation, and gratitude? And are those even really all three the same thing? We'll get to that in a minute. But in my own household, when I was raising my three boys, who are all teenagers now, when they were little, at night we would read our stories, and before bed we would say, thank you, God, thank you, or good night, God, thank you for today. Thank you for, and then they would list stuff. It might be Halloween candy. It might be that they got to spend the night at their best friend's house. It might be for, you know, that perfect cup of hot chocolate. Who knows? They're little kids, right? But they also remind us that those are the little things in life that actually sometimes do matter and do make for a great day. Again, they're teenagers. I seriously doubt any of them utilize that spiritual practice every night before they go to sleep. But the goal of instilling a perspective of gratitude in all that they do might still be playing itself out. You know, we'll see. But really, that's all the church at Philippi was when Paul was writing them these letters. They were toddlers in their faith. They didn't know how to integrate these practices into their daily life any more than little kids do until we teach them. They were children reciting bedtime prayers, saying grace around the kitchen table, and trying new and different ways to be faithful Christians. Speaking of which, today's scripture opens with a verse that I know best because I sang it as a little kid. And we're going to try that 
only if you want to. You can join along. But what I learned was a round that started with rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Last time, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. Um, if any of you didn't know that, I apologize, but I hope what was really felt in the room was how potent those little kid messages are, and that sometimes the simple ways that our faith is passed on are the ones that stick with us most closely throughout the years. And what's kind of crazy is that in this passage that I read, there are at least four of those kinds of nuggets of faith, those little, you know, single clause theology pieces that we hold on to, and we don't even realize we know them. We say, oh, I don't have a great devotional life. I don't read the scriptures a lot. And then you read a passage like that, and you're like, oh, but I do recognize those things. So besides rejoice in the Lord always, what else can we hold on to from Paul's letter? Well, there's the peace that passes all understanding. There's that litany of whatever's true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing. Think on these things. And then there's the phrase that we even have in our stairwell here in the church that a lot of people turn to in times of adversity. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whew, told you it was packed. Now let's try to unpack some of that together. Years ago... I attended a retreat when I was a part of the United Methodist Campus Ministry at Kansas State University. We now call it K-State Wesley. And that retreat was for campus ministry um, groups from all over Kansas, and a retired pastor came to lead us. And I don't remember much about him as an individual, but I remember very significantly one of the teachings he gave us. Now, this was early to mid-90s, so the store successories was everywhere. I don't know who remembers those, but in the mall at Oak Park, at 95th and Quivira, down on the plaza, any number of places, they sold framed posters, usually some picture of a Rocky Mountain or somebody on a bicycle race or, you know, some inspirational, powerful sort of image. And there was a word under it that was supposed to motivate you and a phrase um, that connected it all together. But his point when he was talking about those was that it sounds good if you say it fast. And so I did some searching, and I found that that store still exists. And one of their current phrases they sell says, be the bridge. Problems become opportunities when the right people join together. Now, they don't exist in the malls the way they used to. They've kind of turned their focus to corporate gifts. So if you've ever received a cross-body bag that says teamwork makes the dream work, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) But the idea that it sounds good if you say it fast says, let's look at this a little bit deeper. And we'll try with the example that I just gave. Be the bridge. Problems become opportunities when the right people join together. When we look more closely, we see the message does not say problems are opportunities for people to come together. It requires the right people, but who decides who the right people are? And what if you underestimate the contribution someone could make? And what does the second phrase really have to do with building a bridge in the first place. See what I mean? It sounds good if you say it fast, but take it to its logical conclusion and it doesn't really hold up. But these sayings from Paul hold up, so let's see why. Let's loop back around earlier to when I asked the question about the difference between thanks, appreciation, and gratitude. I'm not using Merriam-Webster today, so don't hold me to any of these, but I think it's fair to say that thanks is an action, it's an outward expression through words, correspondence, or gifts. Appreciation is intellectual, it's a thought. You understand the value that someone or something has in your life. And gratitude's an emotion, it's held deep in your spirit. The three are interconnected, but they serve different roles in our relationships. Likewise, When this scripture passage, this section of an intimate and personal letter from Paul to the Philippians starts with rejoice in the Lord always, Paul isn't saying you have to go singing and dancing through life, though if that's how you roll, by all means. But instead, Paul is saying 
to embody the joy of a life in Christ until it emanates from every fiber of your being. Our clue about that comes from the follow-up sentence where he says, let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Gentleness. Rejoicing in the Lord can be exuberant and it can be quiet. It can be seen in how you talk about your faith and it can be seen in how you live out your faith every day. I want to jump next, actually, to when Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It seems easy enough, right? Well, I was at the funeral of a grandfather in my life just earlier this week, and before the Mass, his eldest read through his thoughts on life and faith as written in 2016. Now, Maury was 96 years old when he died, so he'd been preparing for a little while. His advice and reflections exemplified this verse. He had lots of gems in there, and not all of them were completely original. But one was always tell the truth, and you never have to remember what you said. (laughs) While listening, I had the same reaction to his wisdom as I do to this commendation by Paul. It sounds good. It sounds easy if you say it fast. These seem like simple enough tasks, but in a day and age when our values are challenged by television shows, local politics, international crises, staying focused on justice, truth, and purity of spirit can be complex and difficult. Paul wants the Philippians and us to be people of integrity, but he tells us that the payout is fantastic. Keep on doing the things you have learned, and the God of peace will be with you. Ultimately, that's what brought our family comfort this week as we lay Maury to rest. He was safe in the arms of God of peace because he had kept his thoughts turned toward God's desires for his life for 96 years. The portion of the letter we're working on today closes with another cultural biggie. Don't worry, we're going to loop back around to the one I skipped. The last few verses I read today are actually thought by scholars to be from another letter from Paul to the Philippians. We think that maybe two to three different letters were all combined for the letter as we have it in our canon. But rather than thinking that that's some sort of shortcut, what it does is it shows us Paul's consistency with these people, his connectedness to their problems, and what we can all identify with, the struggles of being the church didn't go away with one good piece of advice. They had to keep coming back to the same themes and have the overlapping and consistent support. So the abrupt change in tone to his personal concerns and circumstances makes a little bit more sense, but it still ties into what this whole chapter has been discussing. Paul mentions the care this church is providing him, his appreciation and his needs speak to the comments he makes about having learned to live in plenty and in want. If we remember, Paul gave up a lot of societal privilege when he became a Christian, and with multiple trips to incarceration, He was stripped further of luxuries and dignity to which he had been accustomed. And all of this leads up to him saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As popular as that sentiment is, it's one that for sure can fall into the it sounds good if you say it fast realm if we're not careful. People tend to use it to deflect fear or grief or nervousness about an upcoming challenge. But looking to other translations helps us find the deeper and more intimate meaning. In the message, it says, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. And the Common English Bible says, I can endure endure all these things through the power of the one who gives me strength. So instead of the Nike style, just do it because God is on your side, what Paul's really trying to say to us is that the hardships of life are bearable because Christ's strength lives in us when we live in him. The Reverend Dr. Cynthia Campbell, professor at and president emerita of McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, wrote this. This could sound like empty sentimentality if not for the fact that Paul is writing from prison. His life as a leader of the early Christian movement has been anything but smooth, but his experience of God's grace in Jesus Christ has helped him find a path to peace 
in the face of physical suffering and persecution. She turns it to the peace and presence of God. And that's really the connective tissue throughout our scripture passage this morning. Each and every one of these little nuggets points us back to being in the presence of God. So now we return to what in the reading falls chronologically second, but is really at the core of our theme for the next couple of weeks. That bringing all of who you are and remembering to offer God's, God thanks is what opens you to receiving the peace that passes all understanding. That's a phrase I use often in my work. I regularly meet with families or patients who are dealing with really difficult diagnoses and even worse, devastatingly dire prognoses. It's very common when offering them care to hear somebody say, this just doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense, it's not fair. And I agree with them, it doesn't make sense. And so I pray that God grant them the peace that passes all understanding because our human limitations mean that we cannot understand how God's goodness will present itself again in our lives when everything is falling apart. But again, just as we have seen over and over today, God's presence, God's peace comes in response to us opening ourselves to it. This does not mean it's not already there waiting already offered without price. It's just that we cannot always receive what we don't put our hands out to accept. In this case, Paul instructs the Philippians and us, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Easier said than done. Turning back to Reverend Campbell's analysis of this passage in the CED Women's Bible, she states, Paul is not in denial about the anxieties of life or suggesting some sort of mind over matter approach. He counsels us to bring everything that weighs heavily on our hearts and minds to God. Hold nothing back. We may think some things are too minor or too shameful for prayer. But the psalmist in Psalm 139 assures us that before a word is even on our lips or a thought in our minds, God knows it already. The big challenge here is to do all of this with thanksgiving. How do we simultaneously consider all of the worries, everything that is heavy on our hearts, and do it with thanksgiving? Remember what we considered a little bit ago. Thanksgiving is an action. It's an expression. We express our thanks to God while we give our supplications, our lists of wants and needs to God. Because to do so without thanksgiving brings us back into that toddler stage that the church at Philippi was when Paul wrote this letter in the first place. I want, I need, please, give me. It's only with maturity that we can offer thanksgiving for the goodness, faithfulness, and consistency of God, which then in turn allows us to ask those deeper things with boldness and humility. A vibrant example of this kind of faith is demonstrated in the kitchen revelation of Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote and preached about a night in January of 1956, not long after the well-known Montgomery bus boycott began. That bus boycott and his presence as it grew absolutely spiked the number of death threats that he was receiving. But at this point, it wasn't just him. He was married and he had a new baby girl and those death threats Death threats came for them, too. He was alone and in despair in the middle of the night at 27 years old. And these are his words. I was ready to give up. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I never had experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go, my uncertainty disappeared, and I was ready to face anything. Here, the kitchen table becomes the altar. The stresses and strains of everyday life while perhaps extremely or more extreme in historical context for MLK, 
are no more and no less than the struggles we bring to God through times of church-induced trauma, addiction, physical and mental illness, isolation, financial distress, and so much more. But it is the act of handing these concerns to God that opens us to hearing God calling us to action and reassuring us that God is always at our side too. Once more, I turn to the words of Reverend Campbell. When we bring the things that cause us stress into prayer, we put ourselves and our troubles inside a much bigger picture. The story of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, a love that is stronger than anything that can hurt us or those we love. And that leads to thanksgiving Recognizing the depth and breadth of God's grace leads to gratitude, and that leads to peace. It's not that our worries and concerns are too small for God or too big for us. It's that with the right perspective, we see our place in God's story. Once we do that, the fears don't get any smaller, but our capacity expands to a place where we can face those fears and engage them without terror. Let's stick with that kitchen table image from MLK for just a minute. The family dinner project is run out of the Massachusetts General Hospital by a Harvard professor, and it has over 20 years of data confirming the physical, mental, and social benefits of time spent as a family gather around the table for shared meals. And whether your inspiration is MLK's midnight prayer or the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday with all its traditions and indulgences, Time spent at the table is never wasted. It is a place where we say grace, where we invoke grace, where we offer grace, and where we receive grace through prayer, conversation, and mutuality. I'd like to close today by reading the poem, Perhaps the World Ends Here, by Joy Harjo. She is a 72-year-old member of the Muscogee Nation who served as the first Native person to be named U.S. Poet Laureate and she served in that role from 2019 to 2022. Perhaps the world ends here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, so it will go on. We chase chickens and dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners and scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table, we gossip, recall enemies, and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain and an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table. We have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy and with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. My prayer for us is that we remember each bite is sweet, and that the sweetness is enjoyed because we have given to God all that which is bitter. God wants us to be at peace, and we achieve that when we resign control, offer thanks, and trust in the goodness of God. Amen. As we hear from God, it's appropriate that we respond together. And so I want to invite us into a time of response. Uh, one way that you may want to use this time is to come to one of these candle tables and light a candle. Uh, a, a few, uh, you can light a candle in any number of ways uh, with your prayer. But um, I invite you maybe to think about a table. Think about a table in your life. Think about the Thanksgiving table that's coming ahead or a table at, at work or at school. Um, Pray for the conversation around that table and that it would be more like the Lord's table, a place of grace and strength, um, of, of honesty and growth. 
Um, pray, pray for a table as you light a candle. Or maybe there's a challenge in your life or in the world, uh, a, a place where uh, you need to find contentment and strength, uh, a, new, a new way. And so uh, pray for a storm in our, in our world, a challenge that, that's happening in your life. Um, or pray for something as, as you need to focus on something that is good and just and honorable and true. Uh, light a candle as a way of refocusing on um, the good things that are happening in the midst of all the other stuff that we carry each day. Friends, you're invited to use this time uh, in response now. I think I'm going under part the waters, Lord. When I feel the waves around me calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord. I hold out your hand. Touch my life, still the raging storm in Friends, will you join me in prayer? All loving God, I hear your invitation through Paul, even in prison, saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. And you say it again, Rejoice. And part of me exults at your invitation, and I feel my soul rising up to do what I'm made to do. And then, God, I also confess, and we confess how hard it can be 
at times for us to make that choice. God, that we can choose, uh, we can choose to, to, to despair. We can choose to find discontent uh, all around us. God, reorient us once again. Turn us again to the life that you have for us, a life of rejoicing, a life of receiving your love and reflecting it back to you and sharing it with our neighbors and all creation. God, turn us once again. God, there are so many places in our world that need your peace that passes understanding. There are so many things, God, that we do not understand. And so we pray for those diagnoses and prognoses, and we pray for loved ones for whom we're caring. We pray for loved ones whom we are grieving. We pray for the decisions that need to be made uh, at end of life and in transitions throughout life. God, we need your wisdom and your peace there. Our world needs your peace, God. Uh, we lift up, again, uh, violence um, in the Middle East. God, we, we, we pray for peace with justice. And we don't have the understanding sometimes, God, to know what that looks like, but you do. And we trust you and we look to you for peace with justice there and, and peace with justice and violence in our own homes and streets and backyards. Um, God, all around us, God, bring your peace. Bring your peace. God, we need your strength. Help us uh, to, to know what it is uh, in, in plenty and in want, uh, in hard times and in good, to, to know what it is to be your people, to encourage one another, and once again, turn to you, knowing that uh, we can do all things, we can endure all things because you have done it first, uh, that you endured all things and you're victorious even over death, and you remain with us, the risen one. And so we give you thanks, we give you our lives, we turn to you and your strength, and your peace, and your joy, and your hope, and your wisdom once again. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're trying some new things, and so I want to invite you to just stand briefly and greet a neighbor near you. Pass the peace of Christ uh, with someone near you. Then we will sing.
Friends, it has been an honor to spend this hour of worship with you and uh, praise be to God for it. As we remember that it is offering thanks to God in the midst of everything that we receive and experience God's peace in its purest form. God's peace is there all the time. Your troubles are going to be there all the time. Why not put together those things by remembering to thank God for God's presence and for the gift of Jesus Christ in our lives. It is in that peace that I invite you to go into the world in the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of us all. Feel it in your heart that you might spread it to all you meet. Amen. Amen.